Constantino. Vale. Pound for pound. Little Giant Boxing. Here with Malik Scott. Malik, what's up, what's let's up? get right into it. Is, is the Wilder Andy Reese fight, is that dead? That's dead. Andy don't want to fight Deontay. Um, his way of saying it was ask for 20, 30 million dollars for a fight that he don't deserve 20 or 30 million dollars for. Just hiding behind the business is what he did. And um, I truly believe that he, he never really wanted to fight Deontay, but it was a good sales pitch. And it was something to keep his name going. But, you know, good luck to him and his father because his father told me that they're making movies, doing documentaries, and they don't need the money. So if they don't need the money, then they got to get the fuck out of the way. What, what do you make of him saying, I'll take 10 million? Who said that? He said that. I know. Yeah, but, but the fight is already not happening. The fight is already not happening. And um, it's good, man. It's, it's like, you know, it's not happening now. And then him even saying that, he was comparing. I hate talking about fighters and their revenue and what they deserve. Because to me, fighters deserve it all. But when you're in a marquee fight and you have an opportunity to make a lot of money, and then if you win in that opportunity, you, it's for sure your money is going to triple for your next thing. Right. You got a shot to make history in a few dollars, and you say no to that. So now you tell me, who is Andrew Ruiz going to fight that he expected to get high revenue from besides Deontay Wilder like who is he going to fight like who so if he it, it, that was his way of basically saying if y'all not paying me 15 million 20 million to fight Deontay y'all might as well not pay me to fight like kind of nobody or like I don't know it's frustrating because I just don't know where he, where, what he's going to do or where he's going to go now I know Deontay was trying to give him an opportunity him and his father they was very big on the opportunity for months but once they realized that they wasn't getting $20 million, I stopped receiving phone calls. The communication became funny. And before you know it, we back here talking about all of this uh, minutiae. All right, segueing. Wilder versus Joshua, monster fight. Yes. Monster fight, two brothers, one from yeah. the UK, one from the US. Yeah, Talk about time. that monster fight. Well, that's huge. I'm very, very big on the fight. I think both of the specimens deserve to get in the ring with each other, not just for themselves, but for the culture. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is for different genres of music, for different genres of clothes, for different genres of, uh, well, when it comes to clothes, different brands. For the young kids that's in, these, in the cities that don't see, see no way out, they could look at Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua fight at the highest level, getting paid the highest revenue, and it could keep their dreams alive. Or it could at least um, you could say keep them inspired, motivate them. Any of that, any of that is such a source. But um, it's a great fight. Um, we all know who my pick is, and um, we mean them no good over there. Like you know, I'm trying to stop what they're doing over there, and that's continuing to win fights. My job is to make sure that Deontay is prepared, violent, focused, and ready to put a hole in him. And that's what he is. He's ready to do. And I, you know, I truly, truly believe that's just, that's that's what's going to happen. You're going to put a hole right through Anthony Joshua. He, he, he's too big to get out the way of mm. anything. Like you know what I mean? Come on, man. Rob Hellenius is hitting you at will with a jab, a pick jab. Rob Hellenius is just hitting you. What'd you think about that performance? Well, it was it was okay until the entertainment. I mean, it was cool. It wasn't what we did to Hellenius. Mm. You know, we treated him accordingly. He's on the second. Helene is probably on his third, fourth half of his career. That fight lasted less than a minute, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was like, you know, and we treated him like what he is. We treated him just like that. Hello. Uh, humans are so funny acting. I swear on everything. My human experience is, you gotta love it. I can tell you're very observant. Yeah. Of what's around. Yeah, absolutely. The human experience can, can, can be a beautiful thing, and then sometimes it's just like, ah, what was that for? But anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a great fight. I'm looking forward to it, man. And um, as far as what Deontay is going to do, I'm going to orchestrate the shit. I'm going to orchestrate exactly how we put the hole through him. And I've already been orchestrating. And I've been film studying. I've been drawing it up. And, you know, I just don't see Anthony Joshua going more than four or five rounds with Deontay. I just don't. Do you, do you think there's a chance that they might wave the white flag, or, or you think it's it, it just ends the way you said it, knockout, who in might, fashion. Who, who might wave a white flag? 
Oh, Asian yeah. people. Uh, it, 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 mm, I don't know. It depends. The good thing is this, though. With Deontay, you know, you get hit with the missile, you ain't got to worry about them waving the white flag. He'll, mm. put, he'll put him out of his own misery. He won't need that. He won't need that. Deontay is the most dangerous man that ever fought, in my opinion, in boxing. Highest very, KO very ratio in heavyweight highest history. Highest KO ratio. That's scary. I'm always punching through you. You know what I mean? Not from some inner city with a bunch of big fighters, big promoters from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Short term experience wise concerning ring experience. And he came and did all of this. And people still saying, what? How and he's not done. How special does that make him and what he's done in such a little time? Late, well, it speaks for itself. It speaks for itself and make him extremely special. Extremely. Um, I don't know no one else that has done what he's done in the time frame that he has done it in and still is doing to the level that he can do it today. Um, he's just, he just a super athlete, man. The most dynamic of all time. Mm. And, the, and he works for AJ if he's watching? I hope a contract or something about to be signed. I hope everybody word is they bond because Deontay is ready to fight. And we're not even, like, you know, he's just training and working out now. We staying sharp. But, um, it won't matter. It there's, won't fucking matter. It won't matter. <laughs> they're saying December, January. Is that still the guesstimation date? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, January it is. And, um, uh, we got to figure out what dates. Like, you know what I mean? We're going to be in Saudi Arabia from what we know. And, um, uh, but if you ask me, Malik Scott, I don't believe nothing has happened in boxing until it's over. That's just me, though. So it's sign of the dotted line. Yeah, and then even then, I haven't seen it go wrong when it's signed on the dotted line. But the Saudis is very big on um, value concerning their country. They're, they're very big on entertainment being brought to their country. And what other way is to bring the hardest punch in the history of boxing to your country and watch them knock out Anthony Joshua? I think it's quite worth it. I think it's going to be an incredible night. And I think um, Deontay Wilder is about to make a whole lot of money with a whole lot of history behind it. So, yeah. There's no doubt about it that that might be the biggest fight of the year if it happens this year. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think, you know, in my opinion, it's, it, it's a treat to the fans that always wanted to see something like a Riddick Bowe and Lennox Lewis in the ring. Something like, you know, Larry Holmes and, and, and George Foreman. You know, isn't that ironic? Isn't that crazy? Not ironic. Isn't that crazy that a great fighter like Larry Holmes and George Foreman, they was from the same era but never fought each other. Right. Larry Holmes never fought Joe Frazier. Like, a certain fighter, Joe Frazier, I don't think, never fought Kenny Norton. Yeah. Like, it's just weird how, like, they all was coming up together, but it's certain fights that never really got made, but it's one man that made sure he fought all of them. That's Muhammad Ali. Mm. And that's where you got to give him the credit at because, you know, everybody everybody was getting it. If you could beat him, you was going to beat him. If you couldn't, God be with you. He was going to, um, you know, embarrass you like he did. But um, I'm happy to be a part of the show, man. It's the greatest show on earth. Being in the gym every day, creating, developing fighters, developing clients. Um, film studying every day, constantly keeping boxing on my mind, getting frustrated at the game, the next day feeling great about the game. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's just, how can I put it on? Um, I think my life is, my professional life is fitting for the mindset that mm. I have and the, the, the re-fall in love that I, have, that I have with the sport that saved my life because It's a different type of love now that I have for boxing. I'm a lot more grateful for it than I ever was. I'm a lot more appreciative for it. Um, it's just a lot, man. Hey, Who made you fall bit? in love with the sport again? Well, just coming from a teaching perspective, mm. because the compassion and the care for others, believe it or not, is more than I ever cared for myself. Mm. So you know, I'm very compassionate about people that I train doing good and you know, providing for not just them, for, but for their families, because fighters they go out here and you know they put so much on the line man and it is not guaranteed that they come at home that night i don't care how many times you see your fighter get in the ring and come home i never take it for granted mm. like i just don't because you know i haven't seen so many not make it back i just was looking at tim bradley um an old clip i love tim bradley and he was saying if you're in a gym and your trainer's telling you go toe to toe 
Ruya, Ruya, and just keep, keep boxing. He's like, get out that gym immediately. Mm. And I and I'm a huge advocate of that. I don't think trainers should be teaching fighters seven days a week how to spar hard. But this is the type of shit that goes on in boxing. Right. Like, not really. That's not how we do it here at the Brickhouse way. Brickhouse boxing is about developing fighters. Brickhouse boxing is about giving fighters opportunities. Um, making sure fighters got a fair, a fair hand and get into the best shape. And um, but you go to a lot of these other spots, man, they still like very, very old school. They still believe in the matter of destroying fighters in the gym before they make it to a fight. And some people may say, well, Malik Scott is soft, man. He don't understand how this shit go. Okay, but I still have a perspective. I still have an opinion. And my, my perspective and my opinion is coming from experience, not hoopla, not minutiae, not sensationalism. Like you know, a lot of these people, opinion be coming from being a fanatic, mm. being an idol worshiper. My opinion about this no bar, it has nothing to do with none of that. It comes from the fact that I've been here, done that, doing this experience and so forth, you know what I mean? I'm 40, I'm 42, I'll be 43 in October. I started boxing when I was 12 years old and it's all I've ever done. So I didn't forgot more things than most people really even know about the sport. I like, you know, I'm giving out gyms all day long on my, when I'm talking about it, when I'm posting on my social media about it, it's pure gyms. If someone is open up, have an open mind and just see how I'm moving, they'd be like, oh, oh yeah. I definitely learned something from that's this conversation. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, all, I'm gonna give you options. Hmm. You know what I mean? I'm, that's, that's the, if someone asks me the type of teacher I am with this, I may not change you totally as a fighter. I may not save you this, that, like all, everything that come with the hoopla is what great trainers are supposed to be. I think it's my job as a future Hall of Fame trainer to give every fighter that I train tons of options in the ring. Anything that can happen in the ring, you should be prepared for. Anything that possibly can happen in the ring, you should, you should be prepared for. You should know how to do everything good going all directions, not just one not just I know how to go this way but not fight this way you should know how to do everything well and your base your fundamentally sound base is extremely important you know what I mean we are in an instant gratification time right now so people confuse speed with the right way just because somebody is moving fast don't mean they move it correct like you know what I mean but the instant gratification time got people thinking like oh that was fast I want to see it again no that's not really it Right. Go look at the fighter that's just working on stepping to his left, stepping to his right, making sure his hand positioning is good, making sure he's turning his shots over, making sure his chin is tucked while he's punching. This is the jewels. And I'm dropping them all day long, man. I'm picking all up free long. game. Oh, yeah, Lastly, bro. any message to AJ and Eddie Hearn if they're watching? Man, I hope they got their popcorn ready because Deontay is training. I'm constantly learning and teaching. Um... It's a beautiful thing, man. I just think it's a very, 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 very good fight. I think uh, Deontay is the best heavyweight in the world. And I think AJ is probably the second, third, or fourth best. But I can tell you what he's not. He's not on the level of Deontay Wilder. And Deontay got a system, and we got a system together that's going to prove everything I'm saying is correct. Last question on this topic. What do you make of people saying, like, after that Andy Reese fight, AJ was never the same? They're absolutely... They're absolutely correct. It's not a bad thing. It's not like that he was worse. He just never was the same. What happened that night that, that changed well, him? Well, he came here for the first time in America and posed the fight. He lost to a short, nice you know, game. overweight Mexican that was very good. Because all of us that's, that's in the end circle, we knew that it was a, a dangerous fight for him. But the great, super smart, intelligent Eddie Hearn, he chose to pick Andy Ruiz. And Andrew Ruiz put monkey wrench and, and everything. And they came back and won the rematch. Kudos to him. It's actually one of my favorite fights of AJ. The rematch with Ruiz and when he fought Pula. Also when he fought Pavekin. You know, AJ does some good stuff in the ring, man. Some real good stuff. But he's at a point in his career now where it just come across like he's second guessing more than ever. More than ever. You know what I mean? And, you know. But we'll see. We'll see, man. I can tell you one thing. That shit he did against Arrhenny is he can't be sitting back waiting for Deontay to hit him because Deontay going to get to you. I'm going to make sure he do. You know what I mean? So. Little Giant Boxing.